Right, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, joined once again by uh, Dr. Mark Feach, State Health Commander Catherine Organ Wicks, and uh, Deputy State Controller Donna Adams. Um, look, where I want to start uh, today before handing over to Dr. Veach to provide um, some more detail in terms of the contact tracking and tracing is just to say this uh, that uh, the Tasmanians should remain calm. Uh, in terms of the primary close contacts in relation to this case, they have all been. Uh, isolated. Um, in terms of the casual contacts, uh, at this stage uh, all the, those that we are aware of have been uh, isolated as well. Uh, I'd make the point that that's all occurred within around a six hour period. The national standard for contact tracking and tracing is uh, around 48 hours. So public health have worked very expeditiously. Um, at this stage uh, there are no more positive um, cases that have um, arisen. Uh, there have been seven test results that we've received uh, back this morning, of which um, four of them are for the students, two of which are at um, the Blackmans Bay Primary School, which were, uh, they were contacts uh, because they were on the flight as I understand it, and another two from the East Derwent Primary School. They have all tested negative as well. So in terms of where we are at the moment, um, we currently have uh, 38 primary close contacts which have uh, been identified. There are another 16 casual contacts which have been identified and there are a further 16 which are being assessed at the moment. Um, and there are that 30 group of 32, both the 16 and uh, the uh, casual contacts and the 16 that are being assessed are, are in isolation at this stage. So again, I just want to say to Tasmanians, um, uh, remain calm public health are doing their job, uh, there is uh, potentially uh, going to be another positive case, but our expectation would be that that would be in uh, quarantine um, uh, with the close contacts uh, having been identified and um, placed into quarantine so quickly. In terms of the situation with the Travel Lodge Hotel, uh, the review is underway at the moment. Obviously we need to understand uh, as best we can uh, what has occurred there. Uh, but whilst we await that review process to um, conclude, uh, we have strengthened the security arrangements uh, and importantly we are increasing the level of CCTV at that facility. Um, I do want to make the point that we've had around 13,500 people through our quarantine hotels of which there have been three breaches, two of which have entered the community. This is one of those. Uh, this happens uh, uh, very, very infrequently, and it is as a result of people that do not want to follow the law. Let me be clear about that. There are directions in place. Uh, it's, these, uh, these breaches occur when people do not follow the law uh, and the instructions that they are provided with. And uh, in this case, uh, that uh, is exactly what has happened. Now, I'll hand over to Dr. Veach to um, uh, provide some further detail. Uh, but in finishing, I do want to say to people, you know, our vaccination rates are increasing. But as we spoke in this room a couple of weeks ago, uh, you know, there is never a better message to receive than the one that we are delivering today in terms of there being a positive case in Tasmania, that the most important weapon that we have, the most important thing that you can do to protect yourself, your family and your community is to get vaccinated. And so I would encourage you uh, if you haven't been vaccinated, um, to take that step, roll up your sleeve and get the jab. I'll hand over to Dr Beach. Thank you, Premier. So I'll just go over the progress of the investigation and contact tracing around this case. Uh, and as the Premier said, um, when we were here this time yesterday uh, speaking with you, um, we had limited information other than the fact of the case, uh, but the contact tracing team uh, very ably led by my colleagues uh, Julie Graham uh, and Julia Mansour, who have done a wonderful job uh, in very quickly identifying all the people who are at risk of infection uh, and, and having them in quarantine uh, by yesterday evening. Uh, some of these people are still having their level of risk assessed, but the critical thing was to identify who they were and to have them in quarantine, uh, so in the event that they became a case, uh, they wouldn't pose a risk to the community. 
there have been 38 people identified as primary close contacts. Uh, these people comprise uh, 16 people from the uh, Jetstar flight that arrived from Melbourne on Monday evening, um, 11 people who were exposed uh, in two households uh, that the case was at while they were out of quarantine, uh, and the remainder of those 38 people uh, were principally people who were at the airport, either as uh, visitors to the airport uh, or uh, workers at the airport uh, who we deemed primary close contacts. Uh, the Premier mentioned that there were uh, 16 people who have been identified as casual contacts. Uh, these are people who have a much lower risk uh, exposure to the case. Uh, we've identified 16 people uh, as casual contacts, uh, and again, they comprise uh, principally people who were uh, at the airport or involved in uh, managing the case during their um, time out of quarantine. Uh, there's another 16 people that we have identified uh, as potential uh, casual contacts. Uh, those people have been in quarantine since last night uh, and the public health team is working through those people with careful interviews to determine whether their level of risk requires them to stay in quarantine uh, or whether it's sufficiently low that they don't have to be in quarantine. Uh, and I expect that process will be completed uh, during the course of today. Um, so uh, really to reiter reiterate, uh, this uh, response has been rapid. Uh, I believe it's thorough, uh, and we've um, uh, contained the highest risk people associated with this case and their movement into Tasmania and briefly uh, within Tasmania. How would you assess the likelihood of there being further positive cases based on what we now know? I think there's um, a good chance that one of these close contacts of this case uh, may become a case themselves. Um, in fact, I, I thought with our case in the north of the state that there was a good chance that there was a case that might arise amongst uh, that person's contacts, um, but so far there hasn't. Um, but I think we have to be aware of the possibility that one of the people identified as a close contact now in quarantine could test positive in the coming days uh, or later in their quarantine period. But you know at the moment about the assistance that this man received leaving the travel lodge and getting to an address which the, um, the circumstances, the precise circumstances of the person's departure from the hotel room, I do not know. Um, we do know that they were uh, uh, picked up by a friend um, and taken by private transport uh, to the northern suburbs of uh, Hobart. Uh, and we know who that person is, that they are in quarantine, so they didn't have any exposure to, for example, public transport. The people who were in contact with the man who's now positive uh, while he was out in the community are now in quarantine. But did they go into the community after they've been in contact with the um, Some of them may have briefly gone into the community, but they pose no risk. People take a day or two to be um, uh, to become infectious if they do become infectious. Um, that was the point about this um, that the Premier and I have both made about the fact that these people who were close contacts were identified very quickly and put into quarantine before they could pose a risk to the community. That's what quarantine is for. Do you know what time the man left the travel lodge uh, I don't know the time he left the travel lodge, but I understand it was uh, on the, the night that he arrived. So I understand there was a call to him after he was in the room, um, but he may or may not have responded to that. Was that a call? So it was a call to the hotel room or a call to his mobile? I don't know which of those it was. So, the, so you're not sure that check that you saw what happened actually did happen? There is a check, and I understand the check happened, but I don't know whether I don't, I don't know whether he responded to it. Was it his friend or his partner that picked him up and who was he planning to go and visit? I'm not providing those details. Given the information that we currently have at hand, in addition to the four sites that have been identified, are there any other sites that you have concerns about that maybe potentially expose your site? Uh, no. If we hear about any sites, and, and we do go back to people and interview them over the first several days if there's any suspicion of there being missed sites. And the other thing is that we, we sometimes hear Rumours, 
um, directly put to us or, or, or in a roundabout way. Uh, and we always investigate those to make sure that there's no, whether or not there's any truth in them. So you're confident that, aside from the hotel, the trip and the location this person's gone to, they haven't gone anywhere else, such as a supermarket or a restaurant or a cafe or whatever else? No, we have, we, we don't believe this person has been to any of those public sites. Uh, and that's my, the, the point that I was trying at some pains yesterday to make, uh, is that we want the public to focus on the sites where we know someone has been. They're the public exposure sites where there's risk. Um, and, I, and I know that there will be, I know there will be wider concern in the Tasmanian community about uh, the potential for exposure. Um, you know, maybe they might think that there's something we don't know. I'm fairly confident that we know uh, the, the story. Um, and, and that the containment of this person was very prompt. Um, but people in the northern suburbs of Hobart, people more widely in Tasmania may be concerned about risk. If you're concerned about risk and you've got a sniffle, please get a test. Um, the health commander will shortly explain that, that, that there will be a um, testing bus located in, uh, I think, Gagebrook um, uh, at the end of this week for uh, several days. So that actually also adds access for testing in the northern suburbs. Um, and we know that the vaccination um, rate in the northern suburbs is uh, lower than uh, many parts of Tasmania. Uh, and I would really urge anybody who is concerned about this to act on your concern, uh, protect yourself, protect your family, go and get your first or second dose of vaccine. So can I confirm this man is a Tasmanian resident? This person travelled from, they gave an address in New South Wales in their application to come to Tasmania. But is, are they a Tasmanian resident? I, I'm not going to provide their, their personal details or their residency status. Does Tasmanian have any connection to Wodonga? I'm not going to go into the details of that. The two students um, at East Joe Primary that were removed... Um, Actually, I might, I might just say, whenever we have a case who's travelled from a mainland state. We also share uh, the fact of that person being a case with our counterparts in the mainland state um, so that if they see a need to contact trace uh, where that person has been, they can do that. The two students from East Derwent Primary who have been removed from the school and since tested negative, are they also contacts from the flight or can you indicate how they're contacted? Um, they were not contacts of the flight. They were uh, students who were part of the household groups that, that this uh, person uh, was um, connected with. So did those students get picked up from school on Tuesday and return to school on Wednesday? Um, I believe those people, those, those students are, are what we call primary close contacts. So we've tested them, they're negative, they're not infectious, they're going to wait at home for a few more days, uh, for 14 days and they'll be retested as they leave. They pose no infectious risk at all at the school because they've tested negative already. And the two yeah. students at Blackman's Bay School, um, I'm just trying to understand, they've come from Melbourne and they've gone to school the next day? Um, I'm not sure exactly where they've, which, um, they, were where, where, well, they were on the flight, so I don't know whether they were from where in Australia was, but they departed Melbourne to come to Tasmania. Um, um, and they've been tested, they've been tested negative, they've tested negative. They too will be required to stay in quarantine for 14 days. There's nothing untoward about them coming from Melbourne and being in school the next day? Uh, look, I, as I said, I, I'm not sure of their origin, and in fact I don't even know whether they were at school. I presume they were at school. But um, remember that, um, um, that people can come into Tasmania on a flight from Melbourne and not be subject to quarantine requirements because they've come from a jurisdiction uh, other than Melbourne and just flown through. And that initially returned um, that sort of weak result of his test. Does that mean he is less infectious at, at that point than he might have been later on? Uh, the man turned what we called it, returned what we call a, an equivocal or low positive test, uh, and that is an indication generally of. Uh, lower quantities in the, of virus in the sample. Um, it would be tempting to assume that that means that he was less infectious when he was out and about. Um, the other possibility is that the sample that was taken the first time didn't pick up as much virus as the second sample. So I think we need to treat um, 
uh, we're, we're not, we're, we're taking a very cautious approach to people who he was in contact with even before that equivocal test. Um, so we're absolutely certain we're carefully managing anybody who could have been exposed to risk. The two households that he visited, were they broken in the same suburb? Yes, they were. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'm not sure how close they were together. I understand they were uh, in the neighbourhood. Um, Just quickly, the, he wasn't wearing a mask yesterday when he was being transported from the travel lodge to the other hotel. Was there a reason for that? And do we know if he was wearing a mask on the flight and in the airport? Um, I believe he was wearing a mask uh, at, on the flight and the airport. Um, his transport was a matter for the police. Um, it was a... Um, uh, they took uh, an operational decision um, that it was um, the best, quickest way to move this person as they did. Uh, as you will know, uh, all of the other people involved in this man's uh, transfer were all wearing masks. There was no public risk from that man's transfer uh, from uh, Fountainside, uh, from Travel Lodge to Fountainside. I understand he hasn't been overly cooperative with public health. How difficult has he been making this situation? Uh, I, I'm not going to comment on this gentleman's uh, demeanour or cooperation. Um, the public health team that I work with are fantastic. They're a team of experienced doctors and nurses. They're very used to engaging with people who are distressed because they've just been told they've got COVID, come out, so, out of all sorts of difficult circumstances. They gain their trust, they make multiple phone calls with them, and they work very carefully to get the information that we need to protect public health. Okay. So, Thank you, Dr Beach. And I might just say, in relation to the clinical assessment of both of our um, residents in Fountainside, so remaining in a stable um, condition. So there is a medical assessment that is actually um, carried out at a minimum of twice a day um, and that they remain stable. And noting that it, at the heart of this um, is a person or two people that have COVID uh, in Tasmania and from a health perspective, our concern to ensure that they receive you know, the absolute care um, that is, is required for these cases. So just wanted to make that comment at the outset. And in terms of testing, well, I note uh, that our primary close and casual contacts are in quarantine and Dr Beach and the Premier have gone to some lengths to note um, that isolation and the rapid uh, response to put them into uh, quarantine. Um, they undergo a testing regime. Um, we do, though, encourage everyone in the community with any cold or flu-like symptoms, even mild, to come forward and get tested for COVID-19. And it is that early detection of new cases of COVID-19 that is key to keeping Tasmania safe. In the last 24 hours, we've had 936 laboratory tests completed. In the last three days, 2,800 people have come forward to be tested. And tomorrow, mobile testing will be located at Chris Fitzpatrick Memorial Park, Tottenham Road, Gagebrook. Testing will be available between 8.30 to 3.30 p.m. No bookings are required, just turn up and get tested. And I also remind everyone that testing is available at the Macquarie Point Testing Clinic at 16 Evan Street, Hobart, with opening hours of 8.30 a.m. to 3.30 p.m. In Launceston, there remains a mobile testing clinic located in Newnham at the Taz Tave Car Park at 54A Allenville Rail Allenville Road, Launceston, uh, that will remain open this week from 8.30am to 3.30pm. In addition, the Launceston Testing Clinic, located at 246 to 248 Wellington Street, continues to be open daily. To book a COVID-19 test is simple. Please call the team at Public Health Hotline or go to Testing for COVID-19 and select Register Online. Uh, but noting that the Gagebrook pop-up and the Newnham pop-ups allow for walk-ins and drive-ups, so no booking required. So symptoms include fever, runny nose, cough, sore or itchy throat and shortness of breath or loss, to, loss of taste or smell. If you are concerned, please get tested and remain isolated until you receive that negative test result. And even if you are vaccinated, you need to get tested if you get symptoms. On vaccination, as at the 13th of October, 81.3% of Tasmanians have had a first dose of the vaccine and 66.1% are fully vaccinated. 
In the northern suburbs, our vaccination rates remain a mixed picture. As of Monday, the LGA of Glenorchy is doing slightly better than the state average rate, with 82 per cent of people aged 16 and above with a first dose and 66 per cent fully vaccinated. But going further north, the LGA of Brighton has one of the lower vaccination rates in the state, with 71 per cent of people with a first dose and 56 per cent fully vaccinated. And for this reason, we have a three-day pop-up Pfizer vaccination clinic at the Brighton Civic Centre in Bridgewater running today, tomorrow and Saturday, and we welcome anyone in the area to walk in for a vaccination. More than 600 people are already booked in across the three days, but we also have lots of additional capacity for anyone to walk in on the day without a booking and get vaccinated. So if you live in the suburbs of Brighton, Bridgewater or Gagebrook, please head down to the Brighton Civic Centre at 25 Greenpoint Road between 9am and 5pm today, tomorrow or Saturday and get vaccinated. Elsewhere in the northern suburbs, we are also running a one-day pop-up clinic at Mona in Berrydale on Monday the 18th of October. And while we also have an ongoing clinic in Moona, which is running Monday through until Saturday for the next three weeks. A one-day pop-up clinic will be held tomorrow at the University of Tasmania, Sandy Bay and Newnham campuses. These will be open from 9am to 5pm. Again, you don't need an appointment to get vaccinated at any of these locations, just turn up. In terms of other vaccination options, as I've alluded to, um, walk-ins are accepted at all of our state-run vaccination centres. Bookings are still encouraged if you don't want to wait, but anyone aged 12 and over can walk in and get a Pfizer vaccination without an appointment. In addition to those clinics I've already mentioned in the northern suburbs, you can walk into the following clinics uh, and get vaccinated between now, today and the weekend at Princess Wharf 1 in Hobart today and tomorrow for anyone aged 12 plus. And then on Saturday and Sunday, we're running special youth clinics for people aged 12 to 17 and their adult family members. Hobart City Vaccination Centre on Elizabeth Street today and tomorrow, Launceston Door of Hope Church today, Oatlands RSL tomorrow, Friday the 15th of October and Launceston General Hospital today and tomorrow. Now this full list of state-run clinics beyond the weekend is available now on our website. And I'm pleased to say that the schedule for the mobile bus vaccination service being delivered in partnership with the Royal Flying Doctors has also now been confirmed. Starting on Monday, the bus will head to St Leonard's, Westbury on Tuesday, Strawn on Wednesday, Tulla on Thursday, Waratah, Beauty Point and Beaconsfield on Friday in its first week of operation. And we'll be releasing the full schedule for the first three weeks later today and with details circulated by state and local government sources and through local community groups. Are there any health workers among those who have been isolated as a result of having contact with this positive case? We have four health screeners who were involved uh, in the operation at the border um, who are currently in quarantine. And that list of locations, that's not the total list of locations. Yes, there is. So we'll have a three-week schedule and those locations are for Monday through to Friday next week. And this morning in question time, um, I think it was the Premier that said quarantine is not a prison. As somebody that's worked in the justice and the health space, is that something you can speak to? How are these two situations different? Uh, there is a, a wealth of difference between um, the operations of running uh, a prison or correctional facility compared to a hotel which has been utilised for the purpose of quarantine. And I do note we've had you know, over 13,000 people that have been uh, accommodated in quarantine um, with you know, very minor uh, in terms of the you know, issues or incidents that we've had to follow up from hotel quarantine. And it's, it is a vast difference. And Legally, uh, it is a vast difference in terms of incarceration versus a quarantine. Um, for the most part, we want to make sure that this is a protective element um, for people in the community that we are concerned about requiring quarantine for a period and to maintain their health uh, during that time. Those four workers um, health screens from the border, are they primary close contacts or are they casual contacts? Uh, I actually don't know that. I think that they are casual. Don't know. Yeah, we would need to, yeah.
confirm that. Um, but they're being provided with every support um, and are part of a testing regime. And as part of that risk assessment, if we determine that they're actually not primary, um, that they're subject to the, either the five-day you know, test and then earlier release. And what's the um, ongoing testing regime for the primary mm -hmm. contacts and casual contacts and they tested again? So Public Health, our FIOC team actually tests, uh, set the testing regime according to, yes, whether it's a primary close contact or casual contact. The primary close contacts um, require a 14-day period of quarantine uh, and just depending on the timing of their nature um, of their interaction with uh, the positive case, they will set a testing usually um, in the zero to two days um, following that first interaction. Uh, and then I think it is the 10 to 12 days, but it, it does depend and in each individual case gets their testing regime communicated to them by the public health team. I think given the questions that we've had, if you're actually okay, I'll just give you some information around the applicant's application to actually enter Tasmania. Um, the applicant provided a New South Wales address as his place of residence. Um, he also advised as part of the application process that he'd been to a high level one area in New South Wales and Victoria. Uh, he sought to travel to Tasmania stating he was relocating. He did not provide sufficient evidence to validate uh, the claim that he was relocating to Tasmania and on that basis he was rejected. Uh, he had a rejected application on the 29th of September and also on the 1st of October. Um, How concerned are you for the officers who have been exposed to this person because of their duties? Of course um, we will prioritise the safety of our police officers. Um, we take a cautious approach when any of our officers are dealing with a positive COVID case and as we did on the night when we got the initial result we asked the officers to uh, quarantine at that time um, and are then allowed public health to conduct an appropriate assessment. Um, we have 13 police officers who are in quarantine as a result of the public health assessment and we'll support those officers um, over the uh, next 14 day period. The Premier said in Parliament that this person is particularly non-compliant. Does that present special challenges to police in managing someone who won't wear a mask or won't Basically. Police officers are trained to negotiate with difficult people and as part of that negotiation strategies um, there yeah, are opportunities to obviously negotiate behaviour. In this instance um, the non-mask wearing was to ensure that we got a swift and safe transportation of this individual to the Fountainside uh, facility um, and that was obviously part of the police officers conducting the assessment. The last thing we wanted was to have a physical um, grappling with an individual that's COVID positive to ensure he was wearing a mask. And is this person facing any further police action for failing to comply with directions? No, he's not. And so, are they on top of the 32 in hotel quarantine? They are actually part of those numbers. They're part of the 32. So, they, are they in hotel quarantine or at home? There's a combination of both. And just to follow on. No, we've, um, the two fines he's received for breaching the border uh, requirements and also breaching quarantine. And what level of security is he under now? I think you said with the travel lodge, it's um, you know, private security police checks. What's the situation at the fountainside? Our fountainside has a combination um, of security measures in place and it includes a, pl a police presence. We've also bolstered uh, the number of police officers at the fountainside to ensure that there's appropriate security and to support our healthcare workers. This may be a question for the Premier, but what will happen to this person once their period in hotel quarantine stays? Do police take them care for it? Or uh, we'll do an assessment of what's the most appropriate once the 14 day quarantine period has been concluded. Move to the Premier. Yeah. Thanks, Donna. <coughs> Well, we'll have, allow the review to take its course. Um, you know, one of the things, and I, look, a matter like this, I'm as annoyed as anybody else. 
um, that there has been you know, uh, this uh, uh, opportunity for this person to abscond. You know, how that's occurred, you know, hopefully we can get to the bottom of that. Um, but at the moment, you know, we're taking every step that we can to ensure that um, uh, we strengthen the security at the facility. Uh, the facility has been extensively um, considered prior to coming back into the mix for a, as a hotel quarantine. Uh, and in terms of um, uh, uh, the facility, you know, my view would be that um, it can remain uh, as long as we're satisfied as, as a result of the review. Uh, the review. Are you reviewing um, security contracts at all of those contracts with the government or with the, the hotel? Well, in terms of the, the uh, security and the management of hotels is managed by community stats. Um, but in this case, look, we'll allow the review to take its course. Um, yeah, with these things, and I'm very pleased in terms of the very swift public health response, um, I'm very, very disappointed and annoyed uh, with the behaviour of the individual. Uh, but the important thing is that, um, that we learn from this, that we, um, if there's a gap, that we close it and uh, we get on with things. Is that why do you think that private security is still the way to go for hotel quarantine? Well, in terms of, um, I think this individual would have um, attempted to get out, whether it had been the police, the ADF or private security. So in addition to the... Um, Look, I understand that there are already additional staff on site, uh, but again, uh, noting that whilst we've only had uh, three occasions where uh, hotel security has been breached, and again only two where that breach enabled people to get outside, um, I don't want to go through chapter and verse uh, the steps that we're taking or the measures that we will put in place, because at the end of the day I don't want to provide an escape plan to the, for the next person. What about the other quarantine um, hotels though, would there be additional security measures? Place uh, in terms of and in terms of this circumstance, um, absolutely. And by this circumstance, where we have somebody that enters Tasmania uh, without a, a valid good to go pass, under normal circumstances, that person would have been put on the next flight on that day and returned. Uh, in this case, the timing of uh, their arrival meant that there was no next flight, so they had to be put into hotel quarantine. Now, this happens very, very rarely. Uh, but in those circumstances, obviously, where we need to hold somebody that has come into the state without a valid good to go pass and they require to go into hotel quarantine, we will put additional measures in place. Is there anything more that can be done to stop people getting on planes in the first place without a valid good to go pass? Look, we have had people um, at airports um, informing them not to come if they don't have valid uh, good to go passes. Uh, we initially spoke with the airlines to, um, to see whether or not they could manage that circumstance and they declined. Uh, and as I've explained in this room on many occasions, um, uh, Tasmania's laws stretch to our boundary. Uh, there's no, we have no valid laws that we can apply uh, in Melbourne or Sydney or any other airport in the country. Well, the first thing is he's COVID positive, um, and so that way he will be remaining in isolation uh, until uh, he's uh, passed through that 14-day period and has provided a negative test. As the um, uh, Deputy State uh, uh, Commander mentioned, um, uh, we'll do an assessment at the end of that 14 days. Is it currently a defence to assist somebody to escape from hotel quarantine? Is that something we should be looking at? Well, again, that's a matter for the police, not for me. Um, but aiding and abetting uh, a criminal, in, uh, a criminal uh, sorry, uh, while someone commits an offence is an offence. Um, but again, that's a matter for um, the police to work through. And the fact that there were other people involved in this, does this make you concerned that it could indicate there's a growing movement of people in Tasmania that want to play out the public rules? Uh, no, look, I'm not concerned by that at all. Look, we've got one individual here uh, that has attempted to enter the state um, uh, and contravene the direction that, uh, that we have in place. Now, as I've said, you know, we ha this happens uh, very, very rarely. Um, and in fact, our good to go system has worked very, very well. But under these circumstances, look, obviously, you know, we're working through this um, uh, with the people involved. Uh, and if there are further steps that we need to take, then obviously we'll take them. But I'm, I don't believe that this is a growing movement, no. Oh, sorry, I might have missed this. Is the person, is the friend who picked up this man, has, has that person been? Uh, look, that's not a matter for me, that's uh, a matter for the police, um, but that's uh, a matter that they'll obviously work through. Are you expecting the um, 
government scanning reforms pass through Parliament tonight, or do you think that's going to get into the next week? Well, I would, I would hope that they might pass through this evening. But, um, look, I, as I said uh, yesterday, I think it was, um, you know, my expectation has always been that this would be uh, concluded in the next sitting week. But we'll see how the debate goes. So you're committed to allowing that debate to play out in full, even if that means the legislation may end up not passing this calendar year? Well, in terms of, um, it's, I would be my view that this uh, legislation will pass the lower house, whether it's uh, this evening or on the first day that we resume next week, I, would be my expectation it will pass. The neighbours of that uh, property uh, weren't informed of the case there. Do you think that there is the neighbours? The neighbours of which property? Of where the positive case was found. Well, I don't have that advice um, to hand. Um, Do you think that they should? have been informed that there was a case nearby? Uh, no. Um, and my reason for saying that, um, having somebody in a car or in a house that's COVID positive that you have no contact with is no risk. There's zero risk. Um, and I just want to make that point. Um, you now, it's interesting, like a couple of weeks ago in terms of um, Newnham, um, you know, we identified a hotspot uh, in Newnham and that was when that location was uh, identified and made public because there was a public need for that to occur. Now, in this case, um, based on what we know, with the individual travelling um, to the premises, uh, with no interaction with the community, um, there is no risk. And importantly, the close contacts uh, have all been placed into isolation. First and foremost, this is a public health response at this stage. Um, we'll consider whether there was anyone else involved that assisted this individual um, once the public health response is concluded. Just to confirm that the two children that were in that school had come into Tasmania from a state not subject to restrictions. Thank you. Thank you.